Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. And today, we have an inspiring story of survival. Corey McDonald. In 2011, Corey survived the Fukushima, Japan earthquake. I'm sure we all remember that, where there was a nuclear plant leaking, a whole bunch of lives lost, a lot of stuff going on. So we're going to be talking about that experience and what she experienced during that and after And so we're going to be talking about overcoming life's challenges. So we're going to be talking about what Corey's doing now and how she's helping people overcome life's challenges. Corey, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so happy to be here, Curtis. Thank you. Why don't you start off by giving everybody a little bit of background about yourself? Hmm. Yeah, where do we begin, right? <laughs> because the self is, it's a big journey. I guess the big, the key thing is to share that I am a person who at this present time calls myself a creative healer. And yet through most of my life, that would be the furthest thing that I would ever use to describe myself. My journey was pretty bumpy for the first few decades of my life, but there came a turning point, which you mentioned in the, in the, my intro, when I was, life was bumping up in my life on the outside. And then I actually um, found myself caught in the earthquake underground in a train in Japan, where I'd been living for quite some time as a, at that time I was a young mom and um, something happened in that earthquake that completely upshifted and transform my life into a new trajectory and started me on a path of self-healing. And wouldn't you know, all the things that lifted my vibration and changed my heaviness to lightness, they became things that I knew they if they could work for me, they could really help others. So they became the things I became a student of and then mastered and now share in the form of, I, I have a few modalities. One is called trans for our transpersonal art therapy, and the others are called uh, energy healing and heart speaking, all mostly nonverbal modalities that I kind of weave together and into this thing called creative healing. And that's what I do now because I, I've come to see after working with thousands of people in the past decade that we all, when we're not in survival mode and in depression and anxiety and anger and all the things that I had wrapped around my myself, when we get out of that, we're highly creative in all sorts of ways. And we are actually in our joy when we're in our flow of creativity. And I don't mean with a paintbrush, but it can be that way. It can be with how you cook or how you put yourself together with your clothes or how you create a business or a podcast. (laughs) Like right now, we're creating this right now, co-creating actually. So that's what I do now. And I work with people or groups who need to have some heaviness, have some challenges. And like like those amazing upcycle artists who can take something from the trash that seems absolutely worthless or broken and it's discarded actually those artists they can turn that into a masterpiece and i've seen that we can do the same thing with the most broken and painful pieces of our life underneath them when we pivot those pieces when we learn creative power tools which i love to teach people especially people who don't believe they have a creative bone in their body as I was many, many years ago. Yeah, we can take those heavy trapped emotions. And when we pivot them, there's something underneath there that really wants 
to come out and express itself in our life. And there's ways to learn this. Nothing, nothing in school ever taught me this. So it's kind of like my heart's mission to just pass these tools on to as many people who need them, especially now with what's going on in our world. Well, let's talk about the Fukushima earthquake. Everybody mm-hmm. heard about it, you know, it was all over the news. So walk us through that day, you know, what, what you experienced and even after, because, you know, they talked about the nuclear plant leaking and all the stuff going on. So walk us through that experience that day, what you experienced and your feelings going through it and also the after effect. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really powerful. In fact, I wrote a book and I noticed that 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 is a huge, powerful moment for so many people's lives. And like you said, even if you weren't there, we are all connected now through the media. (laughs) So we feel and see these major life events. And that was a, they called it the triple disaster. Because you're right, the earthquake, then triggered a tsunami, which then tripped up the nuclear power plant. So like it, within 24 hours, like all of our lives changed. And I um, had been living in Japan for over a decade by then. And I'd had my, my children, three children were all had their formative years in Japan. And by then I was speaking Japanese and my husband and I just feel so connected. And so it was really powerful experience for us. For me personally, I call it my miracle moment. And I actually write about it in my book. And I'll just, is it okay if I read a little bit to tell you the story? Sure, go ahead. And then it happened in a moment. Everything shook me up, literally. It was 2011. And I was on a tightly packed train traveling back from Tokyo on my way home from a first time session with a new therapist, a warm, deeply intuitive woman who had just given me the support and guidance that my heart had long been crying out for. By this point, I'd been suffering from depression for some time. So to leave her feeling curious, even a little hopeful, was a big thing in itself. She'd really shaken me up in a good way. She said the depression I'd been stuck in for the past several years was due to a rift between who I thought I should be for others and my authentic self. Appealing to the artist within me, she told me to start over, to just turn everything upside down and begin each day by sitting in absolute silence with my paints. No more retelling my victim's story and no more running around saying yes to everyone, joining endless coffee mornings and helping everybody and joining committees or asking for my support only to return home to my children and husband depleted and resentful that I said yes again. Nothing more, nothing less. I held her words like a lifeline. She promised if I was faithful to myself in this way, if I was watchful, things would change for me. And in turn, they changed for all those around me. As I wrote everything she told me down in my journal on the train ride home, I wondered what it might look like if I really took her advice. And suddenly the train jarred. It lurched forward wildly. The infinite, infamous earthquake that triggered a devastating tsunami had hit Japan and left all of us passengers trapped underground for several hours. So much transpired during those hours that I could write a whole book about it. But for now, I want to focus on two key things that changed my life miraculously that day. I would never have guessed that those hours spent together underground would become a doorway to awakening to a new life. The first thing was how much love and universal intelligence is flowing to us through an ever-present silence, which our noisy lives drown out completely. My therapist had actually mentioned the importance of connecting to this divine silence, and I I actually experienced this intimately that life-changing day. See, when you find yourself sitting in a train full of people in this sort of situation, one you've never been before, so much happens in your head. You wonder what's going on with no idea how it will play out. How bad is it 
I mean, is this the big one that was supposed to hit Japan all these years? What is happening out there? Why are we slamming and shaking still? I had so many questions and nobody to ask. And nobody had any answers amid all that confusion on that train that day anyways. So instead, I found myself listening to this divine silence, which was actually so strong inside me in contrast to the continual aftershocks that were throwing us about. I could hear my innermost self so clearly as I turned within. And the silence on that dark train was oddly beautiful. It took me somewhere that felt strangely familiar, but perhaps now I felt perhaps how I felt as a child snuggled up in the falling snow in Canada. Words can't really capture it, but if I could choose a few words, they'd be the following. Deep calm, slow stillness, beyond fear, pure knowing, pulsing life. The sublime silence I felt so deeply in the midst of all that upheaval was a profound contrast to the confusion and discord all around me, in my life as well as on that train. I was shocked to become aware of this new wave of calm spreading through me as waves of aftershocks shook the train. I was a stranger among strangers trapped underground, and yet I felt deep inner peace. That's from the first chapter of my book, Life in Full Colors, where I share a bit of my story, but many, many stories of people who, in their own way, had their own miracle moment where they found more of who they are in the midst of a really, really heavy trauma situation. Like for me, after that happened, we finally got a beautiful signal that we could bump that train up close enough to an exit. And it was almost, Curtis, like a rebirth because it was so dark, you know, and just being tossed around. And then all of a sudden, when we could see that bit of light, we knew we could get off and just get up the tunnel and out of the underground and make our way home, even though it was pure chaos outside. I could at least run. (laughs) I was young. I was a runner back then. And I ran. I ran home to see where's my kids, where's my husband. And when you go through something like that, all of a sudden, all the things that were so painful and so seeming so impossible, they, um, they kind of fall away. And what really matters is the ones we love and taking care of one another. There's a lot of old people on that train, you know, we were all helping them. And I spoke Japanese. So I remember asking this beautiful, like, Obasan and her husband, oh, grandma and grandpa, and asked them, like, where are you? Dokuni Sindumas, like, where are you living? And they were living way farther than me. And they had a bigger journey home. We all had to go by foot. But he looked at me and he said, but we're alive. We're alive. And big smile. And then you heard of many stories of shop owners, 7-Elevens on every corner in Japan, you know, just giving away food, people opening up their rooms and hotels for these people who had a long way to go home, you know, it was, it was a big life lesson for me. And I made a promise to, at that time, I didn't really believe in a higher power. I'd thrown everything away. I made a promise that if I get out of here, I'm going to follow that impulse that I've been avoiding to study art therapy. And I'm going to go, I won't even have time to study. I'm going to go up north and I'm going to help them. Because I started to hear more and more reports as we came out where it was coming from, this epicenter. And I knew it was from up north. And I said, I'm going to go up there. I'm going to help the survivors. I'm going to take art, let them get that heaviness out of them. I knew that much. And then it played out like that. That's how I started my journey of sharing art as a therapy tool with people, just on the impulse, you know? Yeah, it's amazing how life just opens up doors where we didn't see there would be a door before. It definitely is amazing. And I'm definitely glad you survived. And how long did you stay in Japan after? And what made you decide to leave Japan? Because it sounds like you were there for a while and 
you really enjoyed it and you, you were getting used to the culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. In fact, that's a great question because at that time, most of my friends fled from Japan. When you mentioned the nuclear power plant, that was really disconcerting for a lot of people. You know, they start to think, wow, that's where all the food, all the rice is grown in that area. So there was big concern about, you know, contamination and how would that affect our food? So a lot of people fled. And fortunately, my husband's work is partly why we pop around the world. He's working, running international schools, which is like a school system in all these different countries where maybe your a family gets sent there to work for, I don't know, cosmetic company, car company or something. And you know, it's for a season of life that you want your kids to continue learning in English. So these schools were there and he just felt this sense of duty. His, his heart is to be creative in education. So he connected actually with the U S military has a lot of bases there. And he, they together worked daily to check the air quality, you know, and they, they were constantly checking is, is the wind bringing this over here? And it turned out it was not nearly as bad as people thought it to be. And so We ended up staying a couple more years until a job opened up in Thailand, in Bangkok at a new school, and then we moved on. But yeah, I will forever hold a special place in my heart in Japan because the things that happen too, you know, Japanese culture, it's not like us in North America where we're easy to give a hug right away or, you know, jump into a friendship really quick. It's an ancient culture. They take time. And it's beautiful. It, I learned a lot about going slow, about the power of silence. Often most is, a lot is expressed in Japan, in Japanese with the things that aren't said. And so to experience what I did after the earthquake, for example, my neighbor who we had a warm relationship, but it's not like we've really talked that much, even though I would practice my stumbling Japanese with her and she was always so sweet polite to listen to me and try to coach me a bit. After the earthquake, when she saw me loading up the truck to go up north, and another miracle opened up that just by chance, a couple friends I had met my first year in Japan, so over a decade before, they suddenly had an impulse to call me because they said, Corey, we're going up. They're photographers. They said, we're going up with a team to provide like trauma relief. And we just keep thinking about you because when we met you, you were telling us about one day you'd like to share our therapy in the world because it had helped me a lot. And so they invited me to go on their team. So when I was packing up the truck, I remember this neighbor watching me and she was so moved. And she said, "I, I can't go up to help. And I said, well, no, it's not everyone shouldn't go up, but I have, I think I have a tool that could help. And she was so moved and it was amazing. Curtis was the first time we exchanged a hug and tears (laughs) over our fence, our little fence. And I remember thinking, wow, this is big that these things that are so painful could sometimes be the things that get our guards down so that we can really connect on a human level. And she supported me so much. She supported me financially. She she went out and got the neighborhood to bring together as many art supplies. Also, she she reminded me I was going with a Western mindset. If you look what I was taking up, she said, you need origami paper. <laughs> That's a very soothing tool we, we create from paper. And I thought, oh, yes. I was taking, you know, the things we'd have, paints and <laughs> clay and things like that. And it turned out the origami paper was the best because I didn't have a water supply to wash hands or like, you know, it's a disaster zone. (laughs) So it just was gorgeous how we really need one another to make something really happen in this world. So it was so special. And then to go from Japan to Thailand was a complete contrast, but a, a, a bunch of new lessons there too, to learn. So every country seems to be, for me, another school to learn a new culture. You have to really watch and listen and then flow with it. And 
there always seems to be another energy or healing modality that I learn. In Thailand, I learned a lot about energy healing and the power that we have that we can tap into to heal ourselves. So that was beautiful to realize, wow, wherever I've gone in this world, I can learn from the culture. And also there seems to be a teacher or a life situation that I learn from, and I can pass that on to another. I'm really, really grateful for how my life journey has transpired. I, I didn't know it would go this way. <laughs> so tell us about your book and any other books that you've written, any other projects that you are working on right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the book came through during lockdown. At that point, we had gone from Bangkok to Dubai in the Middle East. And like the rest of the world, we all got locked down that March. And so, yeah, suddenly I, I had a really strong pull to create through writing, which kind of shocked me because I usually just grab a paintbrush. But suddenly I saw that no matter where I was, like whether I was in Japan, working with a small group of, of women there that I had met, we formed a, a healing circle, or whether I was in Bangkok, working with a group of teachers at the international school or kids, or whether I was with some a team working in a corporation in Dubai, there was always a rhythm to what we were doing. We were, like I said, of the upcycling artists, taking stuff that felt stuck or broken, and we were taking it, putting it into a picture, really. It could be a scribble or a doodle, just dumping it and seeing what wasn't working, and then imagining or imaging in what is working and showing what that is, creating a template for that, and teaching them how to actually bring that into their day-to-day. -day. So I realized it broke down to seven steps. And then during the lockdown, these seven steps were really clear to me, and I quickly captured them. And soon the steps also were asking me to reconnect with people from all over the world that I had met and worked with who fit those steps, you know, like memorable moments. And so I was able to, yeah, call them or get on a Zoom or send a message and ask, can I share your story and how are you? And that was so much fun because everybody who I'd met in that moment of time, they had transformed so much. So it was like <laughs> finding out that all those, those sessions or those moments of creativity where I had the honor of being with people who were in a really heavy place. They had really trans pivoted and transformed their lives for light. So there's a whack of stories of different people to explain the steps. And the book is called Life in Full Colors. Unlock your childlike curiosity to uncover and activate the creative intelligence you are. And so within that book tucked in are seven, I call them transformative power tools for leveraging the challenges you have for your ultimate life creative material to make a life where you can be your true colorful radiant self not all the things that feel like they're taking you down <laughs> so when you were in thailand it sound like you moved around quite a lot how did thailand help you add to your skills and tools as a creative healer. Mm. Yeah, Thailand was a really wonderful experience because I had the chance to actually set up a physical studio. And with art therapy, well, with any therapy, that can be a big word that stops people from stepping in because therapy can feel like, wow, there's something really wrong with me. Like, wow. But actually, when you look at therapy, the Latin of it is therapia, which is to intend towards. And we're intending towards growth. And using art to do that, well, we're not talking about making a perfect picture of a sunset or a, a portrait. We're literally talking about 
moving energy out on a page, kind of like a kid in preschool scribbling out some amazing <laughs> energetic, you know, drawing. And, and so moving to a place like Thailand where things like, it's a Buddhist country, so things like meditation, yoga, um, retreats, they're very much embraced there. So I felt like, wow, we just went on this huge, I've went on this journey with so many students and participants and workshops, and we could meet together in a space. And I learned so much about the power of, of doing upshifting work in a group. Because when we are all alone, we're just, well, scientists say they can break us down into the smallest quark and we're just vibrating energy. But when we get those energies in a room together and we're all doing it with the intention to grow, the, the things that I saw were amazing. For example, I remember this one group, they got to know each other after a few months. So the trust was big and everyone felt really free to just let everything onto a page and they got really skilled at transforming whatever was stuck that week. Like, I don't know, my partner's driving me mad with this or <laughs> my, um, I'm worried I'm losing my job. I don't, but I'm kind of ready for a change. I'm not sure which way to go. Like you could bring anything onto a piece of paper. And so one day it, we were realizing it's getting near the end of our course. So they were feeling like a bit nostalgic, but excited about all they had learned and everyone got the sense that they were ready to to move on they were ready to some of them become artists which shocked them because they didn't know how creative they were some were ready to start new careers it was that kind of energy so they decided as a group because we make it as we go let's create not looking at each other i mean they usually would sit in a circle on the floor they decided to turn their backs to each other and kind of have a surprise with what came through in the paintings that day. So they were flowing in the paint. I think we had drumming music on and I walk around and my jaw drops because every single painting has wings. There were a lot of birds that came out. There were a couple butterflies and then there were some kind of just abstract gestural wild paintings with this, these gestures like an, opening of wings I was so excited for them to be finish their flow so we could turn around and show each other the paintings because they saw it right away wow they were flying they were ready to fly right out of that course and into their lives and moments like that where we see that we are so interconnected and when we gather and we're real and authentic and vulnerable with one another and when we share the things that aren't working together, our synergy, it's just, it's nature. We just, we help each other to elevate. So Thailand for me was like a playground. <laughs> I could try things and test things like, and, uh, and I didn't do it myself. It was always noticing the energy of the group and saying, guys, I feel this. What do you feel? And they would always reflect back to me, yeah, yeah, this feels good. Or no, we want to go this way. And I learned so much about listening and following as, a, as an art therapist, rather than thinking I had to lead and have everything figured out. I mean, it was new for me. And I was so grateful to understand that the best way to lead is to listen and learn. I learned a lot in Thailand. Or what what can we expect from you in the future? What what kind of things are you working on? Got any more books coming up? Any more courses, podcasts, anything like that? Hmm. Uh, I was just having this conversation with my husband because from Thailand, or sorry, Thailand. Yeah, we went to Dubai for four years, and now we're we're over here in Europe in Belgium, and we're back in four seasons and. There's this pulling on us that we kind of wonder. We've done, we're doing this loop. And Curtis, we're kind of wondering if we're making our, our way home to Canada. <laughs> so we've been having some beautiful thought experiments about like, we don't know how long we'll be here. While we're here, we're so enjoying it. Of late, it's been a lot of work I've been giving with energy healing because that can be done remotely. 
So for example, the other day I had a, uh, someone reach out to me from, from Canada and energy isn't bound by time or space. So she was having health problems and we can just set a time. And all I need is to envision her, envision her in on my healing table and bang, she can receive it. And the feedback, it's almost wonderful with COVID because of this distance, because it shows, I'm learning to trust that, that the distance doesn't at all change anything. She had a huge response and she's off some of some medication that she's been on for three years. So I'm noticing that in Belgium, it seems to be less art therapy and more energy healing. So I go with the flow. But yeah, when we talk about returning to Canada, we were getting really jazzed about the idea of finding a space that's so connected to nature because Belgium right now, we're living right smack in the middle of a thousand year old forest. And it's, it's been good for my soul, for my whole family. And we're, we're missing that. We haven't been in four seasons for seven years. So it feels good to be back in alignment with the cycles of nature, the natural rhythms of life. So there's something in there growing in me, Curtis. I feel like something about no longer working alone. I think if anything I learned, and I just spoke to Synergy, that there's a lot of people in this world that are doing great things. And I would love to co-create maybe retreats or courses collaboratively because we can't do it all alone. We're not meant to. So that's kind of where my soul is pulling me right now. And even my husband and I thinking about maybe we can join our skills and create something together where we're using the gifts we have in new ways. So that's been on my heart. And for now, I just continue. People can make bookings on my website. I always give a free 15-minute consult because everybody needs to feel comfortable with their healer. And it gives people a chance to feel into me and see if it's the right path and which modality feels good to them. Art, energy, just heart speaking. And then we go forward like that. So we're mostly working remotely through Zoom right now. And curious, like you asked, is there another book? And the more I wrote these beautiful stories of transformation of people I've met all over the world, and the each day I'm here in Belgium, when I meet people, I don't know what it is, but people love to tell me their story. I kind of wonder if there's a book coming through about beautiful stories of grit, and resilience, and transformation that I've kind of collected as I journal after people share me their stories. And I think, oh, I would love to share those out in the world. We need to know that we can turn things around, especially when we're not feeling it, you know, those days. <laughs> so yeah, that's all going. If people want to find me, my website is creating healing with Corey.com. And Corey, it's so Canadian. We always say sorry. So it's spelt like sorry, <laughs> but with a C, C O R R Y. Yeah, and give out any other social media links. Or are you on social media and how can people connect and, and engage with you on social media? Yeah, definitely tuck into my Instagram. It's at Corey, again, C O R R Y, and McDonald. I'm a Mac, not a Mick. So M A C capital D-O-N-A-L-D. And that's where I tuck, I share a ton of stuff on there. Like I'll do time lapses of different processes you can do yourself. You don't got to be an artist. I use crayons. Like we're talking preschool and then you don't get stressed out. You get to just feel the power of play. I also share different things on there. Like I, I sometimes have people jump in on live streams with me who are doing things that are interesting and upshifting. And yeah, I'm often sharing stories where I am reading snippets of my book or just giving support out when I feel inspired. So I don't do it every day, but when my heart feels the pull, I trust the process. So yeah, definitely connect with me there and reach out. If you have anything that you're feeling is really stuck or trapped, you're not meant to be living like that. I didn't know that. 
for decades. Please know you came here for the joy and you can create it. And I'm really happy to show you the way. Do you have any final thoughts before we close it out? Hmm. I guess it's just to know that you are here to express the power and the, the creative intelligence that is holding all of life together. And your unique expression is unlike anyone else. And you're meant to figure that one out, but not alone. And if it feels hard, it's probably because you're trying to do it alone. And if you ever feel the pull or the, the nudge to grab a certain book that might lift you up or listen to a certain podcast that might give you some tools or to reach out to someone that resonates, even if it feels scary, just do it the first time. Ladies and gentlemen, Corey McDonald. Corey, I want to take this time to thank you so much for joining me today. It's such a pleasure. I'm so grateful. Thanks for having me. Anytime. And listeners, please be sure to like, follow, rate, and review after listening. And for all you Android listeners, Go to the Google Play Store and download the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast app. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.